events that happened in 1863 and in 1963, two very significant years in American history. Again, I am Angela Stewart. I serve as the archivist for the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University and as Vice President of Women for Progress of Mississippi. And I am your host for the History Matters podcast for Women for Progress Radio Network. Now, history matters. Why does history matter? The University of Wisconsin at Madison's Department of History explains that because history gives us the tools to analyze and explain problems in the past, it positions us to see patterns that might otherwise be invisible in the present, thus providing a crucial perspective for understanding and solving current and future problems. We have to know where we've come from to know where we are and where we're going. That is why history matters. And I just want to outline what we are going to be talking about today because we have a really full evening this evening. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about two crucial years in United States history, 1863 and 1963. 1863, this year marks the 200th anniversary of the start of Reconstruction in the United States. Reconstruction. You know, the Oxford Dictionary defines reconstruction as the process of changing or improving the condition of something. And that's what reconstruction in the United States was all about. So that's going to be our first topic for this evening. This year is also the 60th anniversary of the March on Washington. August 28th, 1963, over 200,000 people gathered on the Washington Mall in Washington, D.C., that wonderful, iconic space between the Washington Monument and the Lincoln Memorial to protest for jobs and freedom. It was a one-day event organized to bring together diverse groups of organizations, of people, of issues to talk about how do we move forward in the United States. So that's the March on Washington. 1963 is also the 60th anniversary of the Mississippi Freedom Vote. The Mississippi Freedom Vote. Mississippians had, you know, The first topic I mentioned we were going to talk about was Reconstruction. Reconstruction was the first time that men of African descent had the opportunity to vote in Mississippi. But once Reconstruction formally ended and formalized with the adoption of the 1890 Mississippi Constitution, most African Americans in Mississippi weren't able to vote in elections. So in 1963, a newly organized organization, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, put together a mock election which ran Dr. Aaron Henry, a pharmacist from Clarksdale, Mississippi, and longtime president of the Mississippi Conference of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, and Reverend Edwin King, the white chaplain at Tougaloo College in Tougaloo, Mississippi, to run for governor and lieutenant governor. Over 80,000 African Americans voted in churches and beauty parlors and places throughout the state, proving that when given the opportunities, African Americans in Mississippi would vote. And so this was another significant event of 1963. And then I want to talk about, and part of the reasons why I selected these topics for this evening, is I want to talk about a movie that has just recently 
been released on Netflix entitled Rustin. Bayard Rustin was a longtime civil rights and labor rights and gay rights activists in the United States. And Higher Ground, the production company of former President Barack Obama and former First Lady Michelle Obama, have just released a Netflix movie starring Coleman Domingo about the life of Bayard Rustin as he organized the 1963 March on Washington. And then I want to close out our discussion today talking about Kwanzaa. Since 1978, Women for Progress of Mississippi has hosted Kwanzaa in Jackson, and we continue that tradition with hosting the first night of Kwanzaa on December 26, 2023, at the two museums in Jackson, Mississippi. So again, welcome to History Matters Podcast. And again, I'm Angela Stewart, and I am here, and I am grateful for the work and support of Women for Progress Radio founder, Willie Jones, Mrs. Willie Jones, and our executive producer, Mrs. Juanita Stewart-Brown. And so we let's start with our first topic which is Reconstruction. Now, 1863 seems like a weird year to say that Reconstruction started, because as we know, the United States Civil War didn't end till April 1865, two years later. But in January 1863, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, which in theory freed enslaved individuals living in states that were still in rebellion against the United States. It had no effect on enslaved individuals living in border states such as Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware, which were slaveholding states, but that didn't rebel. So it had no effect on those states. And it had little effect on states in rebellion because they, as of January 1863, they were still very much in rebellion. As a matter of fact, the city of Vicksburg and the city of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania would not fall to Union forces until July of 1863. But there were areas in the South, particularly in Tennessee, some areas of Louisiana, and even in the Carolinas that came under Union control in 1863. So preliminary work on Reconstruction began in 1863 in these areas. Now, what was Reconstruction? You have to understand Starting in December of 1860, a month after the election of Abraham Lincoln as the first Republican president of the United States, Southern states that held slaves, which were all Southern states, uh, began leaving the Union. And they began with South Carolina was the first to leave the Union. In January of 1861, Mississippi would follow up until the point, a total of 11 states in the Deep South would become part of what would become known as the Confederacy. So that's 1861. They consider them no, themselves no longer part of the United States, no longer subject to American law, so that when the United States federal troops had to restock the federal fort at Fort Sumter in South Carolina. Confederate troops fired on federal forces and that officially started the United States Civil War. In the South, the Southern forces would be led 
by Robert E. Lee, the same man who had captured uh, John Brown at Harper's Ferry a few years earlier. The federal forces, the United States forces, after several attempts at commanders from George McClellan to Ulysses S. Grant would settle on Ulysses S. Grant as their commander in chief. And so this is what was going on in the war. But the ultimate goal for the United States, particularly President Abraham Lincoln, is that one, the war would end in success for the federal troops. And two, that meant bringing back together two parts of the country that had become totally separate. So how do we do that? President Abraham Lincoln's goal was to make it as easy as possible for former Confederates to rejoin the Union. So he only wanted, he only was going to insist on 10% of Confederates signing a loyalty oath. They all had to agree that the 13th Amendment was valid and that slavery was over to rejoin. And those were the primary provisions of President Lincoln's 10% plan. President Lincoln was, of course, assassinated in April of 1865, shortly after Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at the courthouse in Appomattox, Virginia. And his vice president, um, Abraham Lincoln, had actually recently started his second term as president of the United States. And he had switched out vice presidents and selected a gentleman, Andrew Johnson, who was a Southerner from the state of Tennessee, to be his vice president. Um, what Andrew Johnson, still a loyal Southerner, added to uh, Lincoln's lenient plan was simply that he wanted high-ranking Confederate officials to apply to him personally for amnesty and to give their loyalty oath to him personally. But other than that, he was in line with what uh, Abraham Lincoln had decided on for Reconstruction. Andrew Johnson and the United States Congress would be at odds. The United States Congress was controlled largely by what were known as radical Republicans. And I have to add this, um, when we talk about the Republicans of the 1860s, they are in no way the ancestors of current day Republicans. Most current day Republicans are descended from Southern Democrats. From up until the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, the United States Southern region was largely solidly Democratic. People like Richard Nixon and Barry Goldwater had made small cracks in that solid democratic base, but it wasn't until the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980 that most Southerners, conservative Southerners would become Republicans. So this is a totally different form of Republicans. The Republican Party was founded on the idea of free soil, which meant the elimination of slavery. It didn't necessarily mean equal rights for people who had formerly been enslaved. Matter of fact, people such as Abraham Lincoln actually proposed and wanted the idea of colonization, sending enslaved individuals back to Africa. Um, they didn't see how African Americans and white people could live together as equals in the United States. So that wasn't the goal for most Republicans. So that's why 
for Republicans who did have that goal. That's why they were called, quote, radical Republicans, people such as Thaddeus Stevens, people such as Benjamin Wade, who would co-author what would become the Reconstruction Act that would lead to what became known as congressional or military reconstruction, which would be the ultimate determinant of reconstruction and how, for example, the state of Mississippi where I live would rejoin the union. You know, John Brown, before he was uh, executed for treason after the um, raid on Harper's Ferry, said that the only way slavery was going to end in the United States was that this land would have to be purged with blood. That was his prediction. And it turned out to be true. The, uh, and the only way that people who, were, who had formerly been enslaved could have their rights protected in the South, in the immediate post Civil War era was through the military, the United States military, the federal troops that were stationed in states such as Mississippi, which allowed Mississippi to, in 1868, 1869, draft and adopt and ratify what would be, it still is Mississippi's most um, liberal state constitution it would be the state constitution that would introduce the concept of public education and universal man suffrage. Because you have to understand in the 1860s, we're not talking about women voting. Most women in America didn't get the right to vote until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So we're mostly talking about giving men, all men, something about voting in the United States, it started out very restricted in the United States, when they, around the time that the United States Constitution was written. The people who were looked at as being the most responsible and important people to vote, who had the right to vote, were rich, white, property-owning men. And that was the limitation they had to be rich, they had to be property owning, they had to be male, and they had to be white. And over centuries, the franchise has been expanded to include people, men of African descent, to include women, to include people as young as 18 years old being able to vote. So the franchise, the right to vote in the United States is something that's always been expanding. And this is one of the things that the 1868-1869 Constitution in the state of Mississippi did for Mississippi. It allowed Mississippi to have two of uh, the two first United States senators of African descent were both from Mississippi. Hiram Rhodes Revels completed the last year of Jefferson Davis's unexpired term as United States Senator Jefferson Davis, who had previously been employed as the United States Secretary of War, which was the early name for the Defense Department, who had been superintendent at the United States Military Academy at West Point, and right before the Civil War was serving as a United States Senator, had left the United States Senate to become president of the Confederacy. So Hiram Rhodes Revels, an African-American originally from North Carolina, he was a teacher, he was a preacher, he would go on to preach at Zion Chapel, African and Methodist Episcopal Church in Natchez, Mississippi, and who would become the first president of my alma mater, Alcorn State University. But he also served as the first 
person of African descent to serve as a United States Senator. Um, there's a wonderful lithograph that was created in the late 18th, early 19th century of early African-American Congress people. And he is included on that lithograph, Hiram Rhodes Rebels. Then you had Blanche Kelso Bruce, who became the first person of African descent to serve a full six year term as United States Senator. As we know in the United States, we have 100 senators, two from each state, and they serve 100, I'm sorry, they serve six year terms and they serve in classes. So there, there are three classes so that all of the senators are not up for reelection every two years. A third of the Senate is up for election every two years. That's in the Senate. The United States House of Representatives is based on population. So you states have representatives reflective of the populations of their state. And those representatives run for re-election every two years. And John Roy Lynch, would, who served in the, in the Mississippi House of Representatives, is still the only African-American to serve as actual Mississippi Speaker of the House of Representatives, of the Mississippi House of Representatives, would become the United States Congressman for the House of Representatives from the 6th Congressional District in Mississippi. Um, for those of you not from Mississippi who may be listening to this, I always like to emphasize that he was the sixth, he represented the 6th Congressional District. He was from North, Southwest Mississippi, Natchez, the Natchez area, and that's the area he was representing. But I like to point that out because currently Mississippi has four United States representatives. In my lifetime, when I first became eligible to vote, we had five United States representatives. So in the 1800s, late 1800s, when John Roy Lynch was serving as a United States representative, we had six. Then in my lifetime, We've had five and now we're down to four, which highlights the loss of population in Mississippi as a state. But he was able to serve in the United States House of Representatives. There were men of African descent elected as Lieutenant Governor, Alexander K. Davis would serve as Lieutenant Governor for the state of Mississippi. James Hill would serve as Secretary of State. Thomas Cordoza would serve as Secretary of Education uh, for the state of Mississippi. All of these men served during what was known as Reconstruction. Now for most states, in order to complete the process of Reconstruction, most Southern states, you have to, one, take a loyalty oath saying that you would no longer um, promote or support the idea of a separate country such as the Confederacy. You would submit your loyalty to the United States of America. Two, they had to adopt the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution and ratify those and accept those as real law in the United States. Um, Mississippi is unique in that we didn't rejoin the Union until 1871. And by 1871, all three amendments technically had been passed because the 13th Amendment was passed in 1865. The 14th Amendment was ratified in 1868, and the 15th Amendment was ratified in 1870. Uh, but for whatever reason, 
it wasn't until the 20th century that Mississippi finally adopted the third, ratified the 13th Amendment to the United States. Now, the 13th Amendment said that it abolished slavery except for punishment for crime, so that if you're in prison, they don't have to pay you when you work. That's your punishment. Um, the 14th Amendment, the reason they're called amendments is that because you have to change the United States Constitution. And part of the and part of what had to be changed with the 14th Amendment is that the 14th Amendment, I mean, the United States Constitution declared people of African descent as three fifths of a person. So that part of the United States Constitution had to be eliminated. But the 14th Amendment also made people who had formerly been enslaved and considered three-fifths of a person, United States citizens. It also extended rights of due process, the same rights that extend in the United States Constitution with the Fifth Amendment to the federal government were extended to the states via the 14th Amendment. And then the 15th Amendment gave all men, regardless of race or financial standing, the right to vote. All male citizens of the United States, the right to vote. So that was Reconstruction. It was also rebuilding. During the United States Civil War, for example, I am a native of Jackson. I am a native and I live in Jackson, Mississippi. And Jackson became known as Chimneyville because in a lot of areas, the only things left standing were chimneys. So the rebuilding that was physical rebuilding that was done after the war was do, doing, done during the period of Reconstruction. Now, on a national level, Reconstruction formally ended with the election of Rutherford B. Hayes as president of the United States in 1876, 1876. Um, but and that went into effect after he was inaugurated in 1877. So 1877 is usually seen as the end of Reconstruction. But I expand because there were years between 1877 and 1890 when African Americans were still in political power, they were still voting. It wasn't until for Mississippi with the passage of the 1890 Constitution, which restricted voting by saying that first of all, one of the conditions it had, you had to have ancestors, men who voted before the Civil War. And most people, uh, men of African descent, didn't have anybody who voted during that time period. You had to be able to read and understand the Mississippi Constitution and the people who constructed the Constitution said out loud, you know, they said the quiet parts out loud that they were writing a Constitution that even they didn't understand. And when you consider that your interpretation had to be done in front of somebody who didn't want to give you the right to vote anyway, that was a very subjective thing. You had to pay a poll tax and you didn't just have to pay a poll tax, but you had to be able to pr produce your receipt to prove that you paid that poll tax. So it was a number of things. And most of these things were so effective because the people who put together the 1890 Constitution, they recognized that the United States Supreme Court would not strike down easily provisions that didn't, that seemed colorblind. You know, so that if you didn't use the word race, so if you said grandfather, so that sounds like it applies to everybody, but you structured it in a way that it only really applies to people of African descent. If you say literacy, 
it, it doesn't imply race, but since most people of African descent immediately after the war are illiterate, it means they aren't allowed to vote. So all of these things, poll tax, not only did you have to pay it, but being able to track down and keep up with your receipts, all of these things hindered black men. And as I said, this was black men who had gotten the right to vote because women were voting at this time, eliminated the bulk of them from voting. So that by the 1950s and 1960s, less than 10% of African Americans in Mississippi were exercising their constitutional right to vote. So that's Reconstruction. And Reconstruction makes a nice segue into the March on Washington because the March on Washington was held to protest and to fight for jobs and freedom. So that you have to understand the United States, Af people of African descent have been fighting for civil rights ever since they landed in the United States in 1619. They've been fighting for civil rights. But what's recognized as the modern civil rights movement is generally considered as starting after World War II in 1945 when World War II veterans such as Megar Evers, Amzi Moore, C.C. Bryant, and others were coming back to Mississippi after saving the world for democracy and realizing they didn't have any democracy at home. So they were determined to change things in their communities. And then the real poignant, tragic, emphasis came with the murder of Emmett Till in 1955. And that would spur direct action as a form of civil rights activity, not only in Mississippi, but throughout the South and throughout the nation. So, the March on Washington recognized that even though the United States Supreme Court had previously ruled in 54 and in 55 that segregation, at least in terms of education, was unconstitutional. You see, the United States Supreme Court in 1857 said that Black people weren't even citizens. So the idea of them have even being able to come to court was wrong because they weren't they weren't people they weren't citizens that was the dred scott decision then we had and that was in 1857 then we had a prolonged civil war that overturned that decision with the passage of the 13th and 14th and 15th amendments but after the end of Reconstruction, in 1896, a gentleman who could, as is popularly said, could pass for white, Homer Plessy, was on a train. He was made to move from where he was originally seated to the colored section of the train. His case went all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And in 1896, the United States Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson said that segregation, so long as it was separate but equal, was constitutional. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People started filing lawsuits challenging this idea and they would culminate in 1954 
with the passage of the Brown decision. Now, Brown v. Board initiated in Kansas. A father wanted his daughter to be able to go to the school closest to her home. So he filed a lawsuit and they added other petitioners in other states so that it became Brown versus the Board of Education at all, so that it wasn't even just the Board of Education in Topeka, Kansas anymore involved in this lawsuit. Now, in Mississippi, Brown v. Board, as I said, happened, was adjudicated and decided in May of 1954. Most Mississippi public schools were not desegregated until January of 1970, meaning most children who were six years old when the Brown decision was decided in 1954 most likely went all the way through and graduated high school without ever attending an integrated school. That's how long it took for desegregation to happen in Mississippi. And that case was Alexander versus Holmes, which was Alexander versus the Holmes County Board of Education School Board. And it would lead to desegregation. It would lead to the abandonment of public schools by large numbers of white parents and their children. It actually had more, probably at least in Mississippi, had more significance to desegregation of public schools than the Brown v. Board of education decision. But Brown v. Board was about education. The Montgomery bus boycott and other boycotts looked at segregation in interstate transportation, in public transportation. And these were all issues that had come up and were slowly being worked through the court system. But by 1963, most African-Americans in Mississippi still couldn't vote. Most were being denied access to jobs that provided for life sustaining work where they could support a family. Um, after World War II, in areas such as the Mississippi Delta, which were largely agricultural areas, you had the introduction of mechanization of agricultural work, meaning they no longer needed people to pick cotton by hand. They had machines to do that. Um, that led to the displacement of a lot of people in terms of income, in terms of being able to support your family. So the issue of jobs and freedom were very important throughout the United States. And they weren't just Southern issues. They weren't just African-American issues. They weren't just Black issues. They were issues because there were people all over the state who were all over the country who were, were being denied access to fair housing, to jobs, to education. So that is why there was the need to move forward the movement with the March on Washington um, the major civil rights organizations, American labor and other groups came together to put together a 
march that would ultimately see over 250,000 people in Washington, D.C., in support of the idea of jobs and freedom. So that's the march on Washington. And I'm going to leave that there because uh, I want to talk about Rustin for a little bit. And that's the main thing that that's about. Um, in 1963, June 12, 1963, Megar Evers was assassinated in Jackson, Mississippi. He had been the state field secretary for the NAACP. And he was assassinated in the carport of his home here in Jackson, Mississippi in June. And then the March on Washington was in August. Um, later that year in November, the Council of Federated Organizations and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party was sponsored freedom elections that allowed um, African-Americans to vote most for the first time in Mississippi. Um, and they voted for, they had the opportunity to vote for activist Aaron Henry. Um, Dr. Aaron Henry was a pharmacist from Clarksdale, Mississippi. He was president of Clarksdale. NAACP as well as the state conference of the NAACP and he was president of COFA, the Council of Federated Organizations. And then Reverend Edwin King ran as his lieutenant governor, his running made his lieutenant governor and Reverend King was the white um, chaplain at Tougaloo College who had been an active supporter of the sit-in movement and the students at Tulu and was an active member of the movement in Mississippi. You know, Aaron Henry and Edwin King ultimately received 83,000 votes, mostly from African-Americans. And this was in 1963. And now I want to devote a large portion of the rest of my time with talking about this new movie on Netflix called Rustin. You know, first of all, let's talk about Bayard Rustin, who Rustin is about. Bayard Rustin was an openly gay man from Pennsylvania he had been raised by his Quaker grandparents to be anti-war. He was a longtime labor and civil rights activist. He was a dedicated deputy to A. Philip Randolph, the longtime president of this Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters. Um, and he was a friend and confidant and advisor to Dr. Martin Luther King, beginning with Dr. King's work as president of the Montgomery Improvement Association during the Montgomery boycott, Montgomery bus boycott in 1955 and continuing on. And Barack, former President Barack Obama and for former First Lady Michelle Obama as the first feature production from their production company, Higher Ground, chose to highlight the life of Bayard Rustin. President Obama actually posthumously awarded Bayard Rustin the Presidential Medal of Freedom <coughs> during its administration and looked to Bayard Rustin, a tremendous organizer, as his inspiration in his work. And you know, what you learn, what I learned, well, I already knew, but it, to me what Rustin highlights is that 
people are complicated. No one is perfect. There are going to be challenges and problems and um, people do things that are despicable, but they also do wonderful things, you know, so, you know, there's a richness to people's lives that oftentimes if we put people on a pedestal or totally cancel them, as people say, we miss because we miss the nuances and the complexities of who they are as individuals. And to me, the movie Rustin highlights this. Rustin, the movie, chooses to focus on the approximate eight weeks or two months Byatt Rustin spends heading the organization of the 1963 March on Washington. So the bulk of the movie is about his work with that, but it's so, even with it being that focus, it's so much in it. So to me, one of the weaknesses of it is that it's so much in it that it, you kind of miss things and it kind of feels diluted because it's dealing with so much stuff. You know, they open with three iconic civil rights scenes. One scene is very familiar to me because it happened right here in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. And that's the lunch counter sitting at the downtown Woolworths in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, Ann Moody, the author of Coming of Age in Mississippi, John Salter, who was a teacher at Tougaloo College. Joan Trump Hour, Trump Power Mulholland, who was the first, one of the first white students at Tougaloo College, are all seated at the lunch counter, very quietly, very patiently wanting to be served. And they are being physically attacked having condiments thrown on them by students, primarily from what was then Central High School in Jackson, Mississippi in the early 1960s. So that's one of the scenes, it's that iconic image of the ketchup and mustard and all the condiments being poured on these students as they quietly and patiently sat at a lunch counter. The second image is of Ruby Bridges, a six, a little six-year-old girl skipping along to school. And when you look, when you they expand out the picture, you see that she's walking in between marshals and soldiers as a six-year-old as she goes to integrate a public school, a first grade classroom in New Orleans, Louisiana. And then the last image, Elizabeth Eckford didn't get the message as to when her classmates would be meeting up to, to go to Little Rock Central High School for their first day of school. So she ended up going to school by herself and She's surrounded by all these people who are yelling at her, who are pointing at her, who are being physically aggressive toward her, but not touching her, but just, you can feel the tension. And in the background, you have civil rights music playing in the background. Um, that's how it, because it talks about, you know, 54, the Brown decision comes down, but yet this is what's still going on because all of this is happening in the early 1960s. Uh, then it cuts to a scene of Martin Luther King Jr. This And this is in 1960. Martin Luther King Jr. is being 
asked to lead a demonstration of 5,000 people to the Los Angeles 1960 Democratic Party National Convention to express African-Americans dissatisfaction with de the Democratic Party. And the people who are asking him to do this are Miss Ella Baker, one of his you know, most trusted advisors, A. Philip Randolph, and also in the room is the title character, Bayard Rustin. And the key thing he says in that passage is, own your power, own your power. And we, the story just intertwines with um, Bayard Rustin's life as an out gay black man in the early 1960s and how that isolates him from both old and younger members of the movement. And another thing that I think the movie does a good job of pointing out that I don't even think is his real intention to point out is the changing in the movement. You know, you know, Ella Baker wants um, Bayer to work with these young people because he says if if their energy isn't harnessed, it's going to lead to violence. These are not the same young people who were active during the Montgomery bus boycott or during the even the early 60s, you know, because you have to understand we're talking 1963. SNCC was founded in 1960. So we're not talking about a wide expanse of time in between when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, what was known as SNCC, was founded and this upheaval, this change in students that you see by 1963. Um, a young white man that Tom, that Bayard Rustin is in a relationship with says, you know, none of the groups can work together anymore. And it's, it's not just black and white, even though there's a confrontation between Tom and a black young man, it's old versus young, it's NAACP versus Congress of Racial Equality, it's SNCC versus SCLC, and he says, and no of the none of the real work is getting done because of all of these hostilities, and we see that play out with oh, and this is a younger guy talking. We see this play out with leadership when you see Roy Wilkins, who's played by Chris Rock, and Jeffrey Wright, who's playing Reverend Ad Adam Clayton Powell Jr talk about how they are going to keep Bayard Rustin from being able to gain control of this march on Washington through Martin Luther King Jr. Because, you know, it's very obvious in the movie that both Powell and Wilkins, who is the head of the NAACP, is, are threatened by Dr. Martin Luther King and his popularity, because uh, you know, Roy Wilkins is like, you know, we've been doing this work in the legal system since the twenties. This is litigation is who is our bread and butter. That's what we do. And this walking, you know, marching in the streets and doing all this other stuff is counterproductive. You know, Adam Clayton Powell is concerned once, for one thing, he's a showboat. He's he's all about being out front himself because one of his main issues is that nobody is coming and asking his permission to do anything. But also he's in the United States House of Representatives and he, like he says, he's been fighting since he got there against poll tax to being able to use the restroom in Congress, and he doesn't like the idea of people who don't know all the things that he has had to go through to get things done coming in and overshadowing him and doing things that are going to make his work in Congress harder.
you know, the argument is made by some of the um, characters that um, Adam Clayton Powell Jr. is more about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. But to me, it's, it also demonstrates another weakness of the film for me is that I care more about Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and Ella Baker and the young people such as Joyce Ladner and Rachel Horowitz who are feet in Eleanor Holmes Norton who are featured in this then I care about what's going on with Bayard Rustin who is also a very complex individual he was opposed to he's a gay black man opposed to affirmative action he you can go to YouTube and pull up debates between him and Malcolm X. So he's a very complicated man. And the movie is too short. You know, some people's lives need more than just a two hour movie. They need a mini series. And the people included in this Rustin, not just by it Rustin, but Ella Baker, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., Roy Wilkins, you know, there Anna Arnold Hedgeman. There are a lot of people in this, and it needs more than just a two-hour movie. It needs a seven-part miniseries. It needs a Roots. We need a civil rights era version of Roots, something seven nights long that takes you through everything, particularly from 55 to 1970, because what Rustin shows to me is that two hours is just not going to cut it. It will whet your appetite. I think the movie Rustin whets your appetite for what the civil, civil rights movement is about and the issues, even just the issues surrounding the March on Washington the lack of women voices at the actual march originally. They wanted it to be all male voices. There is a classic image of the big civil rights leaders and Dr. Dorothy Height, the president of the National Council of Negro Women is actually in the original image, but most often is cropped so that it's just the men in the image. It's just Whitney Young, it's just Roy Wilkins, it's just Martin Luther King, it's just John Lewis and others, so that you don't even know that she's there. Another weakness I have, I found with the film, is that it makes it seem like the NAACP is the major organization, and all of these other organizations are just umbrella organizations of the NAACP, and everybody had to answer to Roy Wilkins, and I don't Tell me if I'm wrong, but I don't think Roy Wilkins wielded that kind of authority over SCLC and CORE and Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other organizations that were coming up. So that's another, I think it just, it blur, it, I think it makes for easier storytelling to run everything through the NAACP. But part of the reason why all people remember from the March on Washington really is that I have a dream speech. It's because of the significance and power and charisma of a Dr. Martin Luther King and his ability to go around, you know, all these other leaders. So but like I said, it just shows we need more than one movie. We need a mini series. So I would encourage uh, President and former First Lady Obama to, if they want a, another project they can get behind, is in at least seven part mini series on the civil rights movement. Honestly, African American life. Can, in terms of the civil rights movement in the 20th century could probably do seasons like the crown or something. So that is something I would encourage. You know, today is really 
you know, going by so fast. I have just feel like I just started, you know, the topic. So we're going to continue next time with not only talking about Kwanzaa, but also talking about civil rights and how do we dramatize and tell the story of the civil rights movement. Again, I'm Angela Stewart. I am the host of History Matters podcast for Women for Progress Radio Network. Thank you. And I look forward to seeing you next month. We are found on most on Women for Progress Facebook Live and most uh, podcast platforms. Thanks again.